Hi, this is Kim Family of Tennis Reach. This is part seven of the Federer Forehand series, and this is called The Way of the Bow. A few lessons ago, I put out a video called the Lessons of the Whip, and I talked there about how the human body resembles or can resemble a whip if we implement it correctly, that the body, the thick part of the body is the trunk of the whip, and that the tapered ends that move out in faster and faster curls and whip-like motions can be the hands, the fingers, and finally the, the racket in our hand if we're playing tennis. And that this whip-like release is what we're looking for in this rotational swing model that we've been talking about in the last episode. And just like our bodies can be described as a whip or a whip-like structure, our bodies can also be described as a bow or a bow-like structure. And the tension and elastic energy that is in the bow, we can recreate in our body if we implement it correctly. In the martial arts, they talk about the five bows of the body. Basically, almost everything in the body can become a bow or a bow-like structure. The legs, the arms, the shoulders, the positioning of our hands, all are potentially bow-like structures that can be formed in such a way that we can release energy in an amazing fashion. So we're not going to have time to go into the martial arts version of this, but we'll go into the tennis version of uh, the way of the bow. So before we get too deep into this, let me just show you my archery bow. This is called a recurve bow as opposed to a long bow that has one long bow in it. This has another bow at the top and at the bottom, a recurve. So this extra bend, this extra curve in the bow provides greater strength and stability to this bow, making it more difficult to pull the string back, but building up greater elastic energy to be released into the speed of the arrow. So the recurve bow is something that hunters and people who want to release arrows in a very rapid fashion tend to use. Now some of you out there who've seen the whip lesson and now are seeing this bow lesson might be saying, what the heck Kim, what is this, uh, the Game of Thrones or tennis instruction? Well, I would say that the principle of the whip and the whip dynamics and the bow dynamics are absolutely essential for you to understand and play the game at a high level. Whether it's the Federer top spin forehand, Sampra serve, Rainage serve, there's this bow-like power that's released in these actions that we have to get a deeper understanding of and appreciation of. Just to give you a quick example of what I'm talking about, so in the Federer forehand series that we're talking about, in the paradigm that we're talking about, we see this rotational turn and coiling of energy. And, and basically this is a long process of Federer drawing the string and that at the crucial moment when he pivots his racket back and he has his non-hitting arm extended like this, we have very much like the drawing of the string of the bow. So there's tension in the bow of my legs and across my chest and in my arm and in the lag of this racket as it's held back in this, this position. And my non-dominant side is energized and activated so that I can stabilize this action as it goes through and basically freeze my body so that this can go through very rapidly. And now we see the same thing when we're shooting an arrow, is that my left arm, my non-hitting arm, if you will, in tennis is extended out and is a stabilizing structure in this action, right? Uh, so I'm holding the bow and with my right side, my hitting arm, I'm drawing the arrow back to maximum tension like Federer has his racket back at maximum tension. And there's a moment in time when this arrow is let go and released and the energy goes out and the amazing power of the bow, this can generate an arrow going 200 miles an hour, which is quite amazing. 
Federer's racket, not so fast, maybe 70 or 80 miles an hour on a top spin ground stroke, but still an amazing amount of speed in a short amount of space. One more example of the bow and the release of energy, and this is something my mentor, Doug King, used to do all the time, is that the hand, as I said, all structures in the body can be bows, so the hand and fingers can be a bow, and we can pull the string of the bow back and at a certain moment, we release that tension, that elastic stored up energy, and these fingers, without me doing anything, you know, are traveling, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour, perhaps. And I haven't really done anything except the effort in pulling them back and compressing the string. So this is a good example of how the body can produce effortless energy, but there has to be effort put into creating the structure, and then there's the process of letting it go. So once again, how do you as the audience out there know that this whip and bow-like energy that I'm talking about really exists, that it's a real thing? Well, again, if we look across other sports, we can see the same phenomena going on. Here we see Clayton Kershaw, who is arguably the best pitcher in baseball over the last five years. And you can see the tremendous bow-like structures that he has built in his pitching form with his legs and across his chest. Tremet storing up tremendous energy so that he can throw a baseball 95 miles an hour, you know, a hundred times during the course of a baseball game. Yes, there are several reasons Kershaw can throw that fast. Having a large, powerful, athletic body but how he creates the bow power throughout in the separation of his non-throwing arm and his throwing arm and the tremendous elastic tension he stores there and even more tremendous stored energy in the bow he creates with his stride leg. These are the critical things to understand in Clayton Kershaw's speed and power. You can see even more bow power in our oldest Chapman, who's now pitching for the New York Yankees who holds the world record for the fastest baseball pitch at 105 miles an hour. So you still may be asking yourself, how does this relate to tennis? Well, in this next slide, you see a picture of Sam Groth, the Australian player who holds the world record for the fastest serve at 163 miles an hour. And you can see the tremendous bow-like structures that he's created in his trophy position to store up before he releases this tremendous energy in the serve. Now let's look at the bow-like structure in the Federer forehand. And the first thing we see is this bowl-like shape of the arms where we're creating kind of a, a bowl structure that Federer holds in front of him. There is no buildup of tension in this form yet but it's an important form to initiate his rotational stroke, as we'll see. The real tension imparted is in the deep sinking of his legs and the hoop or bow that this creates, just like we saw the stored energy in the form of Kershaw and Chapman pitching. This stored power of this bow will eventually be transferred with a kinetic chain into the pelvis and hips and eventually into the arms and racket release. In the next slide, we begin to see the importance of this initial passive bow shape of the arms and racket. Federer turns his entire bow structure to create separation between his legs and hips and his upper body. By keeping both hands on the racket and preserving this form, Federer is able to turn his mid-torso further away from his hips and eventually turn his shoulders more than his torso. So he's creating all kinds of stored elastic energy between different parts of his body. And by preserving this form in the turn, it also helps Federer to keep his balance and rhythm. Preserving these bow-like structures is absolutely essential to implementing the rotational swing model we discussed last week. And in contrast, we see something totally different with the linear model as demonstrated by Maria Sharapova in this picture below. Now, I said a lot of critical things about the linear swing model last week, but I don't really think I said enough because there's more. And just because I'm critical of the linear swing model and Sharapova's swing here doesn't mean I'm being negative. 
I just really want you to understand why the rotational swing model uh, is the more and better paradigm for your forehand and for your other power strokes. And we see this implemented by the greatest players, Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal, all have very similar forehands and other things, but particularly here we're talking about the forehand. First, while Federer's bowl-like setup seems to hold the energy and form together that we need for the right movement, <coughs> this split hands movement we see with the linear swing model does the opposite. You could say it spills any initial buildup of energy as the hands split. Rather than keeping the hitting and non-hitting arms and sides working together, it splits the hitting and non-hitting sides right away. Secondly, this linear swing model encourages a linear two vertical posture and stance. We don't see a deep bow in the legs with players with a typical linear swing model. By focusing on the quick separation of the arms into this very tense setup, this becomes an upper body and arm dominated action rather than building power slowly and rhythmically from the ground up. Third, rather than building a rhythmic stroke and movement, this split hands movement sets the arms and racket into a static position, freezing everything that keeps the arms and rackets flowing around the body like we see with Federer's form. Instead of the rounded, smooth, flowing form that Federer has in his stroke, with this linear model we see the immediately splitting and freezing of this movement as these hands split apart and the body comes to a stop. This is quite the opposite rhythm and maintenance of momentum that we see with the flowing Federer model. In the rotational swing model of Federer, we don't see the last hinge, uh, the last setting of tension in the rack until all the way at the end of the stroke. With the linear model, the split hands model, if you will, immediately the hinge of the hitting arm is set all the way back here and once we introduce tension right away into the body, the body is smart. It knows it wants to release that tension right away. So this leads to a premature swing of the racket all the way back here. And so we have this huge swing gate action where the coil of the hand, the bow of the hand is released too early and therefore doesn't contribute to the speed going through contact. A few other criticisms of the linear swing model. Typically, in the splitting hands action, we see the racket swing initiated from too high a level for a topspin shot to generate topspin easily. And in Sharapova's case, we actually see here go down and a little up. So there's all kinds of manipulation that player has to do at the end, roll, trying to roll over the ball, uh, which is impossible in this split second to create topspin. So, Another fault of the linear swing model is too flat or shallow a approach to the ball for a, the vertical topspin effect that we want with the ball. So no, I don't like the linear swing model and I think for many good reasons. So let's go back to looking at the, the bow structure of the rotational model as implemented by Roger Federer. As Federer's hand split, we see the beginning of the string of the bow being drawn back. The non-hitting arm will extend to stabilize the non-hitting side, and an elastic stretch is generated across Federer's chest, torso, hips, and legs as he coils and draws back the hitting elbow. We also see another bow created as he splits his hands. His body tilts forward out of vertical or linear alignment, creating a bow in his back and spine. There's a lot more to say about implementing this bow in later lessons, but for now, note that his body has gone from standing vertical to creating a bow. To reinforce this whole idea of the body turning into a bow, I must also point out how the human spine is also a bow-like structure. You can see some of the recurve to the human spine, like the recurve of my archery bow. Now these additional curves in the human spine are not just for strength and stiffness like they are for the archery bow. The curves provide additional mobility and rotational functionality in the spine, which we'll get into more in later lessons. 
but there is certainly a lot of bow-like functionality in the human spine as it provides centralized stability in the core of the body and it's attached to all kinds of muscles and ligaments that can be stretched against the stabilized bow. So we never want to get too overly literal about these analogies and metaphors about how the body moves, whether it's a whip or a bow. The important thing to use in these analogies is to use them as guides as how our body should look, feel, and function as we generate power in our tennis movements. So if your body looks stiff and vertical and your swing is stiff and linear, you begin to see right away that there's something wrong with this form and feel. In the case of the bow of the back and torso, we need this bow to access the mobility of the spine, which is much more capable of rotational movement in the middle back than the lower back. If we stand too vertical, like most play tennis players do, we simply can't rotate enough to have a dynamic swinging action. And more on this in later lessons. In the next slide, we see Federer dropping his racket in the pat the dog head position to the side and behind him as he tilts back and up and prepares for his arcing rotational swing through contact and his non-hitting arm extended to stabilize his non-hitting side so as not to over rotate or spin out of the shot. As Federer releases the stretched energy of the bow of his body he's essentially releasing the arrow and this is a great effortless, relatively effortless explosion of speed in this whip-like release. In the follow-through, the tension and elastic stretch of the bow has been released and the bow returns back to its original form. The legs still have a bow as the legs will still provide energy to recover for the next shot. And finally, in full recovery, the bow structure and form has fully returned to its start with the arms in this bowl-like structure nice and relaxed. Throughout this lesson and talking about the rotational model and the whip principle, talking a lot about the structure of the body and its form. And so I wanna go into a little bit more broader detail about the nature of form and how it helps us in the tennis game. First, any movement, whether it's tennis or any other sport, is immensely complicated when we break it down into all of its subparts, the micro movements. And so we need a way to create a unified effect and a unified result with all these different actions that we're taking. And so form becomes the container that contains all these different movements in a specific way for a specific result. Next, form helps us integrate <coughs> the actions of the lower body and the upper body. As I mentioned, with almost all recreational players, we see very little contribution with the lower part of the body. It's excluded from the action essentially. So in Federer's form and the hoops that he creates in the legs and the way he transmits that into this release moment, we see the form that integrates the power of the lower body and the upper body. The same thing with the hitting, integrating the hitting side and the non-hitting side. Typically we see recreational players, you know, swinging something like this with this non-hitting side and arm tucked down here and not doing very much. Whereas with Federer, we see it extended, very dynamic, and there's tremendous torso rotation at the top using this non-hitting arm. So he's able to bring both sides of his body together in this action and all the power of his body in this one unified move. Form also allows us to maintain the momentum of the kinetic chain from the ground up all the way through contact and the follow through with the linear model and this split hand, hands action that freezes everything, the whole dynamic action of the kinetic chain is sort of frozen there. Whereas with Federer, you know, everything is moving and flowing all the way through to the very end. There's no stalls and freezes. So maintaining the momentum and energy of the kinetic chain is absolutely essential in the rotational model and for implementing the kind of speed that you want in your swing. So all these bows that Federer has implemented and into his swing that integrates the lower and the upper body, the hitting and the non-sitting height, also provides balance and rhythm for him. 
uh, as he has a very balanced way to begin and ending the stroke in the same manner. So form is really the container of the energy of the swing. And so we have to look at all aspects of form and make sure that there's no leakage, as they say, in the kinetic chain. We don't want stalls and freezes and inefficient transfers from one part of the kinetic chain to the other. So looking at form helps ensure that we have a very efficient sporting action. We're nearing the end of this way of the bow lesson, but I want to leave you with one sort of quick tip to kind of get a little bit of the feel of this uh, action for yourself. And so when we compare the critical moment of the swing, which is better in his slotted position with the hinge of the racket, very extreme. You get the maximum amount of tension here that he's going to release. And obviously compare this to the split arms Sharapova linear swing model. And the idea that the player is going to try to want to start to swing this racket all the way back here. And this becomes sort of one unified slow moving action through contact without much bend or bow in this. Whereas Federer has built all of this up into one gigantic bow structure here at the end that is then going to be released. So to get the feel for this, I would just want you to try to copy Federer's form here in this critical moment. So I want you to get down into your legs much more than you normally do, I'm guessing. You know, really bend those knees, feel a hinge at the hips where you can move forward a little. So we're gonna tilt out a little bit more. We'll get into this later in more detail. Uh, but I want you to get down into your knees. I want you to bend at the hip joint. And I want you to try to create this form here and feel the stretch of the tension in the forearm, the stretch here. And I'm gonna have you do 10 drop hits or against the wall but I want you to do it in a, in a way that is like drawing the bow of the string. So we already have a buildup of good bow-like tension throughout our bodies here. But in order to get even more, I want you to initiate this swing with a forward movement of your legs and hips into the ball and holding the hitting side back as long as possible. So we're creating even more stretch and elastic energy throughout the body. So you start, as you should in any power stroke, start with the legs and the hips turning and holding this back, holding the hinge back before it's released. And only when you absolutely have to will you release the racket. And you should feel this stretch as you do this in your body. And you should feel extra speed as it's released. This is sometimes called the slingshot effect. So do 10 or 15 of these drop hits, initiating, cropping the form, but initiating the stroke with the lower body and hips first, holding the tension in the racket and the racket tip back as long as possible before we come up and explode and release the whip. I want to conclude this lesson on the way of the bow by taking a look at one of the books that inspired me, which was Zen in the Art of Archery by the German professor named Eugene Herigal. Uh, Herigal went to Japan before World War II. He was a philosophy professor. He was very interested in Zen. And he studied the arch of Kudo, which is the way of the bow Japanese art of archery with Master Kenzo for five years in search of what the Zen experience of shooting a bow is like in the Japanese art of archery. Here in this painting you can see the gigantic recurved bow of the Japanese art of Kaiudu and you can also see the bow-like setup of the archer stance providing stability and strength for the lower body while the archer draws the string. Herigal studied with Kenzo for five years 
and after the war, Herigal published Zen and the Art of Archery, a book that has inspired 200 other books with a similar name and was one of the inspirations for the mission statement of Tennis Reach, which is the art of tennis. The heart of this book is Herigal's quest to understand the Zen experience of shooting an arrow, or said in another way, shooting an arrow when you're in the zone, not consciously thinking about what you're doing. Master Kenzo described this experience to Herigal. He said, instead of saying or thinking, I shoot the arrow, I meaning the conscious ego mind, allow the arrow to release so that it shoots on its own. In other words, learn when and how to let go. In wrapping up this lesson, the way of the bow, the whole idea of being able to let go is not an easy process to accomplish. It takes a long time of practice to perfect the technique that we're trying to let go of conscious control of. To letting things go has to be built up with a long series of precise exercises and deliberate practice. And that's what Tennis Reach is also about. So in wrapping up this lesson, the way of the bow and talking about the experience of Dr. Harrigal and Zen and the art of archery, this idea of getting into the zone, letting go of our over trying and our overreaching and our overthinking so that we can just let our bodies perform at a high level. This is the ideal of sports. This is Zen in the art of tennis and in the art of archery. So we had a quick tip about it today. You can't get there with just a quick tip, obviously it takes a long time of practice and diligence to first make all of these movements conscious and study them and then to be able to forget them and become unconscious so that we can let go but that's a slow and deliberate process called deliberate practice which is also what tennis reach is about but if you keep at it and you keep watching these videos you keep understanding these principles at a deeper level Sooner or later, you'll start to touch upon this feeling of letting go. And sooner or later, you keep working on this Federer forehand, you're gonna have a lot better forehand than you had before. And when your friends comment about your game, they say, where did you get that, that forehand of yours? You can say, it shoots and only you, the ghost of Professor Harrigal and me will understand what that means.